Good morning, everyone. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Welcome. It's so very, very good to see each of you. For those of you who are visiting with us, we welcome you. We are thrilled that you're here. We would love to get information from you about uh, your contacts, uh, numbers, emails, etc. I send out a, an email blast every Thursday to, uh, I think, about 10,000 folks and tell people what's happening here. And as a result, we have oftentimes a full room like today. And also we have people who stream in from all over the country and actually all over the world. And so we want to welcome all of you who are with us through live streaming or those of you who will be watching this on our YouTube channel at some other late date. Um, if you would like to be informed and be on our mailing list, we have um, clipboards with green sheets of paper uh, to my left, and you can sign up and be on our mailing list. We don't need your name if you are already on our mailing list. Thank you. Um, we always need your money, so if you would like to pledge to All Saints Church to underwrite these kinds of experiences, we would love to have your pledge, and you could go to the welcome table at the front of the lawn today. There are welcome bags all over this lawn, uh, and we would love for you to take those with you. Uh, they contain brochures about all sorts of information at All Saints Church. And finally, at All Saints, we believe in putting our faith into action, and so we're focusing today not only on the Pope's encyclical, about which we'll be speaking in just a few moments, um, uh, but also Charleston and gun violence. So there are a number of actions to take, um, including some letters to Congress, having to do with the Pope's encyclical and also some, uh, a, a, an issue about carbon um, tax. And also we have uh, an ask, um, participating in the gun violence ask day, which gives you the courage and the equipment to ask about whether or not there are guns and unlocked guns in homes where your children go to play and visit. And uh, finally, there is a sign-on letter to the people of Charleston and Emanuel AME Church. So a lot of action for you to take today. Now, let me introduce our speaker. Our speaker today is the uh, chair of the philosophy department at Loyola Marymount University here in LA. His areas of specialization are contemporary continental philosophy, environmental philosophy, ethics, and the philosophy of religion. He's taught at LMU for the past 14 years, and during those years he's had as his areas of specialization contemporary continental philosophy, environmental philosophy, ethics, and the philosophy of religion. Prior to being named, uh, I just repeated myself, pardon me about that, prior to being named chair of the philosophy department, he was the director of, the env of environmental studies at LMU. He now holds the Charles S. Casasa, Chair of Social Values, and is the Director of the Academy for Catholic Thought and Imagination. He is the recipient of numerous outstanding professor awards, noting his excellence in teaching. His writing deals, among other things, with environmental virtue ethics, human responsibility in an endangered world, and the emerging field of environmental hermeneutics, Catholicism, virtue, and the environmental crisis as well as the power of narrative in conservation. Brian, we're doing a lot of work here about new narrative and having a new narrative of healing. And I want Brian to come back and just talk about narrative one day. Um, I love professors who get involved in governance, and he is among the many LMU governance committees he serves on, is the planning committee for the Center for the Catholic Intellectual Tradition and Contemporary Society and the Environmental Stewardship and Sustainability Committee. So the person we have to talk with us today about the Pope's encyclical on climate concerns is a fantastic professor, someone with expertise and passion about the care of our planet, a consummate teacher, a student of Catholic thought and philosophy, and the kind of professor everybody wishes they had had in college. <laughs> Would you warmly welcome Brian Trainer? introduce it. So we have so much to transact today. This encyclical is so complicated in a very, very healthy way. Much, much there. But it really does bear down on the science. 
and Brian knows the science. And so we're going to start out with a brief PowerPoint presentation from Brian about the climate, clim uh, the, the science of climate crisis. Brian. Okay. Uh, first, thanks so much to the community for having me, and, and thank you so much for choosing to reflect today on this really important issue. It sounds like your community has been very involved in this issue for a long time, and this is not just a, a celebration of this new encyclical, but, but a deepening of a concern that you've had for a while. So I want to begin quickly by noting something that the Pope does in this encyclical, uh, and that is he defers to the scientists in this, the first chapter of the encyclical. Um, he recognizes that when we're asking scientific questions, we should give some priority to the uh, studied opinions and collective opinions of scientists, right? And so if we were training for the LA Marathon and we wanted to get in shape for the LA Marathon, presumably we'd talk to a sports coach and a nutritionist, not to the cashier at In-N-Out Burger, for <laughs> how we're going to conduct ourselves, right? Uh, and the Pope as well, we, we hear a lot of people in public discourse in America say things like, well, I'm not a scientist, but, and then they go on to pontificate about uh, a debate that isn't really happening in science, right? There, there's not a real debate in science, and one thing I think is really valuable about what the Pope does, uh, the Pope is an authority on all sorts of issues and is wiser than I am on all sorts of issues, but he recognizes if we have a scientific question, we should value the opinions of scientists. If I had a medical problem, I would value the opinion of my doctor on the medical problem. Right? It, does, it doesn't mean that experts can't be wrong. They can be. But we should value the opinions of experts. This is something that goes all the way back to Socrates and the philosophical tradition. So beginning with that, I want to do a very, very quick, and if there are questions later, perhaps we'll have time, uh, overview of the basic science of climate change. It's, it, the basic science is pretty easy to understand. I, too, am not a scientist, but you can read the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change reports. The executive summaries, they're pretty, sim they're pretty straightforward, not simple. So uh, it's really lucky that our Earth has um, greenhouse gases in it, because if it didn't, here's what it would look like. We'd have solar radiation coming out of space, hitting the Earth, warming the Earth, but it would all irradiate back, okay? Now the first thing to notice here is that most solar radiation comes in in the form of visible light. The wavelengths of the solar radiation are the wavelengths of visible light. Once the Earth warms, the radiation that is pushed back out into space is infrared radiation, right? That you've seen on movies when people have infrared goggles and they, you're allowed to see heat. So you've got visible light hitting the Earth, warming it, but heat is the main source of radiation that's leaving the Earth. Now fortunately, well, sorry, we didn't get to fortunately yet. With, uh, without greenhouse gases, the average temperature of the Earth would be about zero degrees Fahrenheit. Life would be very different than it is now. Now, with greenhouse gases, you get solar radiation coming in, solar radiation going out, but the thing is, greenhouse gases interfere with infrared radiation. Okay? So the thing to remember is that the greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, uh, nitrous oxide, methane, those greenhouse gases will allow visible light to come straight through, but they will interfere with infrared radiation trying to radiate back out. Right? Just like your car locked on a day like today, visible light can come straight through your windshield, right? heat up the inside of your car. The inside of your car is so much hotter than the outside because the glass interferes, it captures some of the heat, the infrared radiation that's trying to get back out. So because we have greenhouse gases, the average temperature of the Earth is 57 degrees Fahrenheit, much, you know, taking into account the poles and the equator and everything else, much more conducive towards life. There is no scientific debate that greenhouse gases warm the Earth's surface. If we didn't have greenhouse gases, the average temperature would be zero degrees, right? When CO2 and methane and other greenhouse gases are added to the atmosphere, the greenhouse effect is enhanced. It's very basic science, very basic science. Um, so here's what the situation looks like now. W one quick word about the basicness of the science. science. This is starting to change, thankfully. But uh, journalists, especially in North America for some reason, uh, 
because of what I would think of as the misapplication of the fairness doctrine, have given the public the illusion of a scientific debate where none exists, right? You, we've got a debate with 98% of scientists sort of saying the basic science that I just showed you here uh, and the temperature increase I'm showing you in a minute uh, hold true. And then you've got one or two outliers that say, no, wait a minute, what about elves and other sorts of things, right? Um, and then journalists in North America, because of the fairness doctrine, say, well, we have to have both sides of the story. So every time you get a climate scientist on the news, they get some climate denier, some climate debunker on the news as well. The fairness doctrine is really important. It's an important part of journalism. We all should look for that. We should, wherever our political uh, alliances or allegiances lie, we shouldn't be looking at just one news source. We should look at lots of different news sources. We should appreciate the fairness doctrine. But we don't apply it everywhere, right? Uh, every time we get a civil rights activist on the news, we don't get a bigot on the news as well to show the other side. Uh, it, there are physicians in the world, people who hold advanced degrees, who will say things like, HIV does not cause AIDS, right? Which is patently false. The, the overwhelming majority of science tells us we know this, that HIV causes AIDS. It's true, you can always get some outlier, some flat earther who's gonna suggest otherwise. The same is true with climate science, right? It's a massive, massive scientific consensus that this basic uh, science that I'm showing you holds true. Okay, real quickly and then we're done, we're getting into the encyclical. Uh, this bottom line here that you're seeing is the uh, CO2 parts per million from the last interglacial ice age uh, up to the present right there. So the safe level that the climate scientists at NASA, Jim Hansen, he's retired now, and other folks like that say, is about 350 parts per million carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, 350 parts per million. Pre-industrial level, before we started burning coal, things like that, the level was about 278. So they're thinking, well, we could add some to this and not change things. Safe level's about 350. Unfortunately, anthropogenic climate change has already shot us well past it. This orange line here shows the amount of carbon that has been added from anthropogenic, human-caused, human-originated, um, burning of fossil fuels. And we are right about 400 right now. So already 300 parts per million. Sometimes you'll hear, again, politicians say, well, it's, so, it's such a small amount, it couldn't make any difference. We should perhaps ask those same climate deniers if, if it was okay if we added just like a small amount of arsenic to their drinking water. Um, a, a small amount of something can sometimes make a big difference. More unfortunately, this is where we're headed, okay, this red line. The Kyoto Protocols that everyone says are what we should be aiming at are 450 parts per million. That's already well above what slightly more conservative climate scientists say is the safe level, 350. Um, double the pre-industrial would be about 550, and business as usual would be about 650. Um, it could be even more. Every time I look at this data, it looks like we're tracking along for the worst case scenario. Um, and it keeps correcting for that. So uh, that doesn't show up as well as I'd hope. We're already locked into something that will be a very disruptive temperature rise of about uh, 1.8 degrees Celsius. We're locked into that. If we stop burning carbon today, it's, that's already done. It takes a while for that stuff to percolate out of the atmosphere. Some of the social justice issues we're about to talk about, they're already locked in. People are suffering today. Climate change is not a problem for my children or my grandchildren. It's a problem for people today. It's happening. It's happened. Uh, but if we get up to that business as usual, we could be locked in for a potentially apocalyptic 6.4 degrees Celsius, that's almost 12 degrees Fahrenheit. It's hard to even imagine what that would look like unless you're gonna read Cormac McCarthy's The Road. Uh, I mean, it's the, the kinds of disruptions that that could cause are, it, I mean, if you wanna look for uncertainty in climate science, there it is. It's hard to even imagine what that would do to the planet. So that's the basic science. Um, there are a, a number of uh, potential impacts that we should think about, and this will be the nice segue into the encyclical. But among the, the um, disruptions, disruptions in weather patterns, including unpredictability and more extreme weather events. We've got the drought here in Los Angeles. A couple of years ago, if some of you remember, I'm guessing about five years ago now, there was flooding in Pakistan because Pakistan received in a single day 
the equivalent of its entire annual rainfall. So it, it's, it's not just a matter of how much water falls, it's that when it falls and in what amounts. Rising sea levels, ocean acidification is a huge problem. Loss of biodiversity, this is gonna disrupt and has already disrupted agriculture. If any people remember the, the crashed wheat harvest in Russia of a couple of years ago. Water security, which the Pope talks about extensively in the encyclical. Displacement of human communities. And the Pentagon calls climate change a threat multiplier. All the different kinds of sectarian violence we see in the world, all the different kinds of conflicts, they're only gonna get worse when these other types of pressures are put on people, food pressures, climate pressures, refugees, those are all the things we're concerned about, all the things your community prays about for people suffering in other parts of the world, that's only gonna get worse because of climate change. So this is the context in which this encyclical, excuse me, this encyclical uh, comes to us. So let me just put the screen up and we can begin our conversation. So Brian, uh, you, oops, got, got. Um, so you live and work and have your being in a Roman Catholic institution and are immersed in Roman Catholic theology and philosophy as well as environmental studies. Can you just give a kind of a general response that you had to what you've been able to get into in terms of the encyclical so far? Sure. Um, I, should, I should mention quickly, so my background is as a philosopher and, and as uh, an environmental philosopher. Uh, I am familiar with Roman Catholicism. I work at that sort of institution, and I've, I've been immersed in it, but I'm not a theologian. So since we're on the record, let's make, <laughs> make clear about that. Um, so uh, my initial impression was that, um, well, a, a couple of things. One is that the pope is at pains uh, to illustrate the degree to which the concern for the environment and our relationship with the environment that's evident in this encyclical comes out of the tradition. He's not changing things here, right? And so uh, he's at pains to cite scripture, to cite uh, previous uh, teachings of the uh, Roman Catholic Church from previous popes, bishops' conferences in North America and in Africa. He also cites uh, interreligious authority figures. Uh, Patriarch Bartholomew of the Orthodox Church has long been a sort of strong advocate of environmental issues. So the first thing I noticed in reading this encyclical was the degree to which uh, Pope Francis was at pains to illustrate that this is something that comes out of the Christian tradition. This is not some novel change to it. Uh, the second thing that struck me, uh, by, by way of expectation, it sort of struck me in the sense that this is where I would have expected he would go with this, is the, the social justice component of climate change. So what he does, especially in paragraph 15 here of the encyclical, is to suggest that uh, this encyclical is now part of Catholic social teaching. It's part of Catholic doctrine. So, uh, again, not to sort of pick sides in the contemporary debate in America, but people who are saying things like, well, the Pope should leave the science to the scientists and talk about what he's an authority about, the moral issues, that's exactly what he's done here, right? He, he's saying explicitly, climate change is a moral issue, um, which plenty of... Uh, Catholic philosophers, Catholic environmental philosophers, and other Christian environmental philosophers have been saying for a long time, right? These effects, and we may be able to, to talk about more of them in a bit, um, these effects have profound uh, consequences for the poor of the world, for the vulnerable of the world, for women in the world, for children. And so climate change is a social justice issue. Those are my first two kind of impressions. And let me add that I'm really, really struck by how handy this document would be for anybody who would like to learn something about Christianity. Mm. Um, there is so much theology, so much moral theology, and so much about spiritual practices in this document. So I heartily recommend your getting it and reading it. Of course, nobody in this room agrees with the Pope on absolutely everything in the world, but let me tell you, in terms of core theology, moral theology, and also um, social justice issues, which we're about to uh, jump into, 
and also spiritual practices. It's an amazingly comprehensive document for you to just kind of get a refresher course about what Christianity is. And I think a growing change in Christianity. I think he is coming out of a tradition, and I think he's also, by emphasis on certain things, giving some really good change. And we can come back to that. Uh, we have maybe time for it. But let's get into the social justice stuff. I mean, I think that part of the, the radical edge of this is the Pope's critique of economics. So talk to us about it, Brian. So, yeah, um, here's the way I've been thinking of it, that, that in this encyclical, Pope Francis is drawing our attention to a physical reality, the science that I just reviewed, right? But he's also suggesting that this physical reality has come about as a part of social, economic, and political causes, right? There's a reason that this physical reality that we have today and the physical reality we may be headed towards uh, is, is the one we've got and not some other physical reality. And there are social, economic, cultural, political causes to that. And then he's saying later in the encyclical, th there are moral consequences from that, right? So we've got a physical reality that's caused by these economic issues, these political issues, and there are moral consequences of that which make the whole issue a moral issue. So, um, I, I agree that, that you ought to read this encyclical. It's quite long. It's depending on the, on the translation. I believe the English one is about 184 pages, about 256 paragraphs. But um, you can choose the paragraphs that interest you as you, you go through the document, right? Um, uh, the Pope does criticize runaway capitalism, right? And he's not the first Pope to do that, right? The, the criticism of unbridled capitalism, which is able to exploit the poor at the benefit of the something that the Catholic Church and other Christian churches have long criticized. Um, but he speaks specifically of a criticism of, quote, a magical view of the market, right? If, if you looked on that, this idea that we could just give it up to the free market and that will solve everything, right? Adam's Adam Smith's invisible hand uh, that many of you might have heard either in school or in politics. The, the idea there is that if every individual pursues his or her own selfish interests, the best possible situation will be brought about socially as if by, quote, a mat, uh, an, invis excuse me, an invisible hand. So Adam Smith's invisible hand is each individual acting selfishly will bring about social good as if by this invisible hand. And what the Pope is saying, he wouldn't be as lowbrow as I am, but what I tell my students is, um, the invisible hand completely unchecked is doing a rude gesture at some people in the world, right? <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, it's not just looking at things, um, it, it's not just moving things uh, uh, equally, right? People are exploited when everyone pursues this individually. And if I can speak theologically for a moment, um, the, the idea of a, an absolutely unbridled free market seems astonishing for a community of believers like yours or, or others in the United States that thinks of human beings as sinful, right? If we're, if we're sinful, if, if creation is in some measure fallen, and, and what that means for each of us, I'm sure, is a different thing. It, it would seem very odd to say, we'll bring about the best possible world by letting people be selfish and do whatever they want, <laughs> right? There's got to be some sort of check on that. And in fact, Adam Smith himself thought there was some kind of check on that. He's got another book um, called The Theory of Moral Sentiments, A Theory of Moral Sentiments, that puts a check on what you hear about in The Wealth of Nations with the Invisible Hand. Adam Smith believes that there must be some natural limit to consumption that people wouldn't continue wanting to be richer and richer and richer and richer forever. At some point, they'd be like, oh, okay, that's enough. Um, but barring that sort of limit, greed's gonna have a real problem. So he critiques a, magi uh, a magical view of the marketplace, the invisible hand. And then the second thing that I'd, I'd really just mention before we can go on is that he acknowledges that there is, quote, an ecological debt between the North and the South. The global North is you and me, North America, Europe, the global south is South America, uh, South Asia, the Indian subcontinent, other places in the world. What he means by that is this. There's a, a long principle in environmental philosophy um, 
called the principle of uh, commensurate benefits and burdens, burdens and benefits. And, and what it says is this, is that generally speaking, the people who benefit from something should also have to bear the burden uh, that, that is caused by that benefit. That, that was an awkward way to say it, so let me give you the example here. Um, it's curious that the people who consume the most have to deal with the waste of that consumption the least. You don't find smelting plants or landfills in Beverly Hills, right? Those people consume the most per capita, but the, the factories that produce those things, the, the um, power plants that burn the coal, those are all other places. And so Native Americans on reservations are dealing with the coal production that fuels cities where other people, not the Native Americans, get to consume that. And that holds true globally too the global south and the global north. People like you and I get to consume in a way that pushes out carbon into the atmosphere. We fly to Paris for a week or something like that on a holiday, or we fly to New York to see our relatives for a holiday, or we drive alone in Los Angeles back and forth on long commutes and things like this. We're pumping carbon into the atmosphere, and the people who suffer first and worst from that are poor people in the global south. So all of us will eventually suffer in that long-term apocalyptic scenario. Everyone's gonna get it. But the poor get it first and the poor get it hardest and they, they're not getting the benefits that we have. So the Pope says there's an ecological debt between the north and the south. We already owe the poor people of the world something because they've been exploited by this economic system so that I can live in a comfortable house in Culver City with the affluent middle class life of North America that I have. There's, there's no way that that can take place without someone else somewhere in the world being impoverished to make it possible. So. Thanks, before we get to action, um, which that tempts me to jump to, um, let's take a dip into um, this business of having an integral ecology. And um, if you would kind of weave into this response, the whole notion of what is his point of view? Um, you know, what you, one of your specialties is hermeneutics. What is, the, what is the interpretive lens through which Pope Francis is looking at the world, at the church, at human beings? Um, sure. And I just kind of want to set you up also here to talk about the fact that he frequently calls the planet our common home. So if you could kind of talk about what's going on in his soul and his mind and his brain and his... No, you can do this. You're a good professor. You can do this. Uh, just use your intuition, Brian. Okay. And uh, you, you'll nail this. And, um, and tell us kind of what, what's, what's the moral punch here? So uh, first, I, the Pope refers to the planet as our common home, and he says this explicitly in one of the early chapters, to note that this encyclical is directed to the entire world. There, there are other church teachings that are addressed to the Christian community or to the specifically Catholic community, but that the Pope intends this encyclical to be uh, something that believers and non-believers read. It's addressed to the entire world. So I think that's part of um, what's behind the idea of a common home. Um, now, uh, the, the term hermeneutic was mentioned, and some of you might be familiar with that term, others of you might not be. Hermeneutic is a way of, ta it's a way of saying interpretation, right? That when we read the Bible, we're always interpreting it. There's always going to be differences of uh, interpretation with respect to different biblical passages. You guys know this, this is why there are many different denominations in, in Christianity, and this is why people even in the same pew in the same church might disagree about some aspect of the gospel. Never happens here. No, not, not here, I'm sure. <laughs> right. So what, what the Pope says early on, uh, in his opinion, so I can, I can read this far into his mind, is that what's called for, and this is in paragraph 67, is a, quote, appropriate hermeneutic of the Genesis tale, right? There's a long um, history of pillorying Christianity from outside of Christianity, and even from inside Christianity. There's a famous um, philosophical paper called The Historical Roots of Our Ecological Crisis, which is written by a guy named Lynn White, 
who, as far as I know, himself is a Christian. I'm not sure uh, uh, of what sort. But he basically lays the entire environmental crisis on the door of Christianity. And I can't go through that whole paper today except to say this. What he says is, uh, the environmental crisis is a result of a certain kind of outcome from the scientific revolution. When the, when the scientific revolution became technological and science became, instead of about trying to read the mind of God in nature, rather about trying to produce stuff to make things and to make money and to, to dig things up, when science becomes technology, that happens in an environment that is thoroughly, entirely Christian, right? And this is why the scientific and industrial revolution that we have today is one that came out of Northern Europe. It's not one that came out of South America. Uh, it, that's not because people in South America or China or Indonesia aren't equally smart, equally creative, but there was a worldview that made industrialism possible. And that worldview, Lynn White says, is anthropocentrism. The idea that human beings are the sole being of value in the world and that everything else is put here for us to use as we will. And that idea of anthropocentrism, Lynn White and others trace back to the Genesis account where it says, the world's yours for dominion, be fruitful and multiply, right? The Pope says, an appropriate hermeneutic of Genesis is to think of the world as a gift that we are indeed told to be able to use. And human consumption is, per se, in itself, no, no worse than ursine consumption, the consumption of bears, or cetacean consumption, the consumption of whales. What's the, the problem with consumption isn't that we consume. We all have to consume to, to live, right? We need shelter, we need food. The problem is the runaway consumption that views the entire swath of creation as a well of resources for us to use and nothing else. And the Pope says explicitly that's not the case, that the, the world as a gift to us is something that we are supposed to till and cultivate, but we're also supposed to care for and preserve. He says in other paragraphs uh, explicitly that creation in the Genesis account is very good and that everything else in creation has value to God independent of its value for us. So we might value certain forms of, of plant matter in agriculture as food that we can eat, but the life in that plant matter, the, the vibrancy of creation, is valuable to God in and of itself. It's not just there for us to do anything we want with. There has to be a responsible, uh, a proper relationship to that sort of resource. You can't just use and abuse it. So uh, there was a lot in your question, but those are sort of two. But, um, let's let, let's okay. get back to it this way. Um, if you'll, I'm going to refer to paragraphs 49 and 50. Okay. Um, and there's some deft argument, argumentation going on here about not blaming this solely on population growth. Ah, uh, yes, okay. And um, I'd just love for you to unpack that a little bit. I thought it was very crafty. I thought it was yeah. a proactive move. Um, it's not without criticism from me, but nevertheless, yeah. I still think, I mean, we could really distract ourselves sure. to get real simplistic here and reductionistic and say, oh, it's a population issue. Okay. So, uh, I'm still digesting this document, I think all of us are, right? And so I, I don't want to speak authoritatively here, but the Pope does sort of criticize a kind of discourse that says, the problem here is population. And what he's afraid of is that, I suspect, I suspect what the Pope is afraid of, is that in criticizing population, we're ignoring the log in our own eyes, which is consumption, right? There's a lot of people not in this room, I'm sure, but there are a lot of people in North America who will say things like, uh, the problem with climate change is too much population. It's, it's large families in Kenya, it's large families in South America. Well, the average Kenyan has a carbon footprint of something like 1 15th or 1 16th, the carbon footprint of the average American. So until you can find a Kenyan with 32 to 34 children, 
that Kenyan does not have the same carbon footprint of a family like mine, right? Even though my family, I, I don't want to get this, make this about me, we go to extraordinary lengths, I feel, for a, a family in North America to, to try and minimize our footprint. Um, and still, we don't do enough. Um, but we, tr we try to do what we can. So the, cr the, the point about population is that we can't say it's all about population and ignore consumption. Um, now, speaking not about the Pope's mind, but about my, my own mind, <coughs> ultimately it's about both. Population and consumption are two sides of the same coin. Whether you're talking about climate change or food resources or fresh water, it's always a question of how many people living how well. If you go online and do an uh, ecological footprint calculator for yourself or for who you think the average American is, if everyone, in the, if everyone on Earth lived the way the average American did, we would need something like six to eight Earths worth of resources for us to live that way, and six to eight Earths worth of sinks for us to put that waste away, right? So we can't all live the way Americans do. We can't consume like this. If if we wanted a world where everyone could consume like you and I do, we would need to have a world with something like 750 million people instead of 7 billion. Okay? So if everyone's going to consume like the average American, live in a 3,000 square foot house, not in Los Angeles, not for any of us, but in other places in the United States, if you live in a 3,000 square foot house, three or four cars in the family, flying multiple times a year, eating lots of meat, all those sorts of things, we're going to need 750,000 people on the planet. Alternatively, we might be able to have a planet with 14 billion, or 18 billion, or 20 billion, if we're all willing to live like contemporary people are living in, I don't know where, I'm just sort of thinking out loud, Tanzania or something like that. So, Population consumption are two sides of the same coin. What quality of life do we want to have? If we're all willing to wear burlap sacks and eat oatmeal three times a day, the earth can support many more of us. If we want to live with some of the luxuries or even little safety nets sort of things that, that we have in the world, there can't be as many of us. So population is going to be an issue, and the Pope's dancing around that because of the Catholic Church's position on contraception. Although the Pope has also said, he hasn't changed the church's position on contraception, but he has said specifically, you know, Catholics don't need to have, I forget what phrase he used exactly, but you don't, yeah, I thought that was it, but I wasn't going to say it out loud, right? <laughs> you know, you're not obligated to breed like rabbits. You don't have to shoot for a very large family, right? Whatever, con contraception would be a whole other conversation to have, but uh, however you do it, you don't need to have really large families. And if, if you're putting a lot of waste out, consuming a lot, uh, you can aim for a smaller family. Um, so population consumption are two sides of the same coin there, and that's... And I'm itching to get to the, to the action question, but, but before we yeah. go there, one more question, which I think relates to hermeneutic and, and critique and theology. And uh, it has been most recently stated by uh, Jeb Bush, which says, you know, the church is really about making people better people, and it's not about getting into politics. And <laughs> the entire encyclical is operating from a very different perspective yeah. about what faith and religion are about. If you could just say a little something about that. Sure. Uh, I, I don't want to get too political here, but that, uh, that statement and other ones like it seems so disingenuous to me because... Um, the same sorts of people will be happy to make other church teachings political, and they don't want to make this one political. So again, I'll go back to my previous statement that the, the Pope is sort of suggesting climate change is a moral issue. And if Jeb Bush or Rick Santorum or any other Catholic politician wants to say, I value the church's moral teachings, but I don't value the church's economic teachings, right? Jeb Bush said, I don't, I don't go to my, uh, my parish priest for my economic policy. I go there to become a better person or get moral teaching. The, the, the Pope is saying this is moral teaching. Um, I would also say, and this is speaking for myself, not the Pope, um, and my work on virtue ethics, Henry David Thoreau, another a great American thinker, sort of says our entire lives are startlingly moral, startlingly ethical. And what he means by that is everything we do has an ethical or moral component, right? Not just who we forgive or 
to whom we're generous or hospitable or these sorts of uh, core Christian virtues we think of, but how we eat, how we dress, how we work, in the communities in which we live, there's, there's a moral component to all of that. And so the idea that the church is just there to make you a better person, well, that encompasses everything, right? I mean, what, what else is there besides trying to be a good person? That affects your work. It affects how you eat. It affects how you relate to your spouse. It affects how you relate to your children. All of it's moral. Um, and so uh, it, it just beggars belief that you could have an economic policy that was amoral, right? That, or, or, or a technological policy that's amoral, or a, or a military policy that's amoral. It, it, I don't understand how you can disentangle the two. Perfect. So um, Brian and I, in our conversations prior to today, uh, thought that we might have to go without questions uh, and answers today, and that's going to be the case because there's one more beat in, in this presentation, and uh, members of the choir are having to leave. And before they leave, uh, I do want to say I'm very, very sorry, Giddy, that I didn't welcome you. Uh, Giddy, who is uh, Brian's wife, and their two daughters are right here on the front row, and we're very glad you're here. Thank you. And, and, and thank you for being here on Father's Day. Um, and also, I just wanted to say that next week, we're going to touch in on something that's also very timely. We're expecting the Supreme Court to give us their ruling on the 29th, Monday the 29th, on marriage equality. And so we have David Cadell, who will be here, who was, who was Justice Ginsburg's uh, uh, law clerk to get us ready for that. Now, um, so we have three different working groups here at All Saints Church working on this issue from different perspectives with slightly different nuanced missions. And so this is not the last Sunday we're going to be talking about this by any, meaning, any means. But David, kind of as a closeout, what do you take away as um, trying to be a better person? Uh, what is the action to which you think you are called, and your family is called, and, and your kind of witness in the world is called by this encyclical. So I'd just say a quick thing, because we were going to end on this idea of, of taking action. Um, <clears throat> people can often he read the science that I just talked about and get very depressed, right? And so there, there's sort of two things I want to talk about, individual action and collective action. One of the most important things I think about this encyclical is to sort of give us uh, another account of a reason for individual action. Because if you, th if you think of individual action as being efficacious, you'll get very depressed, right? I ride my bike back and forth in Los Angeles, and in doing so, I arrive at work sweaty, and I risk being hit by cars, and all sorts of things like that. And it's not doing anything for climate change. Nothing. I mean, it really isn't. But I'm morally obligated to do something like that, even without knowing that it will cause something good, precisely because it's part of being a good person, right? This is part of the social teaching of the church. Even if you're not Roman Catholic, it's part of being a good person. We should do individually what we can do to mitigate climate change, even though individual action won't stop climate change, for the same reason that all of you in here when you shop for clothing should do your best not to buy clothing that was made by slaves or sweatshop labor even though in buying fair trade clothing, you won't end sweatshops. So you've got to engage in individual action on climate change because it's part of being a good human being. Different generations are called to different things, right? The greatest generation, as it's said, was called to exhibit courage in a very specific way. The civil rights generation was called to exhibit courage in a very specific way. It's my argument that our generation is called to exhibit these kind of environmental virtues and environmental concerns. It's the moral issue of our time. There are other moral issues that a lot of us are concerned about, having to do with marriage equality, having to do with women's rights, having to do with racism. I'm concerned with all those things. This is a really serious background element to all of them, and it's gonna make all of them worse. Women's rights, sectarian violence, everything else. So you've got to get involved in individual action because you need it to be a good person, but you also have to get involved in collective action because this is a commons problem. We don't have time to go to, into what that means, but this is an example of a commons problem. There is no solution, no solution, no solution to climate change that is not collective. 
This has to become a political issue for everyone in this room. I'm not saying it has to be your single voter only issue. There are other issues for all of us. But until we hold our politicians accountable for this in a way that uh, climate change deniers can't be elected, right? Whatever you're gonna, conservative, liberal, middle of the road, green, libertarian, whatever your solution to this is gonna be, you, you gotta acknowledge the reality of it and try and work on it. So there, have to, there has to be some sort of collective action as well. So en ending on action, individual action is important, collective action as well. There's lots of different sources to help you figure out what individual action could help for you. And two final actions. I want us all in this room and everybody who's streaming to be evangelists about this. And one of the ways that you can be an evangelist about this is to take political action like the political action that we have at our action table today and also pay attention to the fact that this YouTube version of this presentation will be up on our YouTube channel and on our website within a day or two. And I hope that each one of you will send a link to this to everybody on your mailing list so that they can come up to speed with where we are uh, as a result of Brian's absolutely brilliant presentation. The last action to take is let's acknowledge that Brian Trainer is our newest best friend and thank him for being here today.